Welcome to another episode of China Update, where I provide you guys with the most up-to-date political, economic, and geostrategic analysis on the world's number two economy. My name is Tony. Let's jump in. Okay, happy Tuesday, everybody. On Monday, yesterday, Vice Premier Sun Chunlan gave a speech during a specially convened so-called Joint Prevention and Control Mechanisms of the State Council teleconference, reiterating the themes of last week's surprising Politburo Standing Committee meeting, calling for all-out struggle against COVID-19, as well as those who question the wisdom of zero cases policy and the strict lockdowns implemented by Beijing. In the speech, Sun also、uh, stressed that the country must quote create a favorable environment for the successful convening of the 20th National Congress of the Communist Party of China. End quote. This incredibly politically sensitive event is set to be held later this year, when it is widely expected that General Secretary Xi Jinping will move into his third. Term. The speech also backed mass testing and vaccination drives, particularly for the elderly, but still provided no roadmap to what an end game would look like for the country. Though over a dozen cities across China have implemented varying degrees of lockdowns at this point, all eyes are still on Shanghai and increasingly the capital, Beijing. The situation in Shanghai remains a mixed bag. Officially recognized cases are coming down. However, at the same time, many restrictions are also intensifying. With so much political pressure, Shanghai authorities are likely trying to push hard to stamp out community infections outside of quarantine. Whatever the cost, if successful, Shanghai may see some light at the end of the tunnel within the next week or so. If successful, on Sunday and Monday yesterday, it's reported that many residents, including some of my own sources, received messages from committees that manage residential communities and compounds, announcing a so-called quiet period, effective immediately and lasting between three and seven days, during which time, in most cases, most deliveries would be halted and residents would be barred from stepping outside. More barriers have been erected, and some community gates have been barred shut. Many of these new restrictions were not formally announced by the local government. It is also suspected that the scope of people being taken into centralized quarantine has been expanded, causing much frustration and anger among residents. One video、uh, shared widely on Chinese social media in recent days before being removed shows police officers in hazmat suits arguing with residents required to go to quarantine after a neighbor tested positive. One officer, in response to the questions of a resident, is recorded as expressing, "Quote: Stop asking me why. There is no why. We have to adhere to national directives." End quote. And another example: Over the weekend, more than twenty leading university professors across the country backed a call led by Tong Jiwei, a well-respected law professor at Shanghai's East China University of Political Science and Law, for Shanghai to quote stop excessive pandemic prevention measures. End quote. In an open letter published Sunday, Professor Tong, an expert in constitutional law, called the measures unconstitutional and a breach of the rule of law. The widely shared letter was censored within hours, and Professor Tong's Weibo account, which had almost half a million followers, was suspended. Meanwhile, in Beijing, officials continue to wrestle with small outbreaks while residents are caught in the middle. On Sunday, Beijing reported zero cases at the community level for the first time in two weeks. But then, soon after, a cluster of 21 COVID-19 cases were discovered in the northeastern district of Shunyi, causing officials to carry out mass testing and expanding measures. Previous to this discovery, the focus of quasi-lockdown measures had been. Mostly on the wealthy and populous district of Chaoyang, home to embassies, government departments, major firms, and one of Beijing's two financial zones. Now both、uh, Shunyi and Chaoyang are largely at a standstill, with public transportation halted in both districts, public venues closed, parks shut until further notice, and residents told to stay at home. Though Beijing has not called these measures a lockdown, and indeed Beijing's measures are not as strict as Shanghai, yet in the capital it does look increasingly like a lockdown by the day. 
Okay, next up, Hong Kong. But first, guys, if you enjoyed the episode, don't forget to hit the like button. It's a huge help. And for anyone who wants to go the extra mile and help keep this channel sustainable, financially sustainable, and subscriber-focused, my Patreon, buy me a coffee, which is great for one-off tips, or crypto links are in the description below. As always, everybody, thank you so much for your ongoing support. Over the weekend, it was officially confirmed that former police officer John Lee will take over from Carrie Lam to be the next chief executive of the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region. Lam, who has served in the city's top spot since 2017, will likely be remembered as heading Hong Kong's Special Administrative Region government through Hong Kong's massive protests in 2019 and the 2020 passage of the deeply controversial national security law increasing mainland control over the territory. Lee is the first chief executive to be elected through a new electoral system advocated by Beijing for Hong Kong. The voting process was closed and Mr. Lee was the sole candidate. State media in the mainland has trumpeted the election of Lee, expressing in one piece today, quote, the Hong Kong and Macau Affairs Office of China's State Council extended congratulations to Lee on winning the election. The success of the election, the office noted, has once again proved the advanced nature and strengths of the electoral system of the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region. In strictly implementing the principle of patriots running Hong Kong, the new electoral system ensures the election of talented patriots in charge of Hong Kong. End quote. The following day, Monday, yesterday, foreign ministers of the G7, Canada, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, the United Kingdom and the United States of America, as well as a representative of the EU, made a joint statement expressing, quote, grave concern over the selection process for the chief executive in Hong Kong as part of a continued assault on political pluralism and fundamental freedoms, end quote. The statement went on to express, quote, the current nomination process and resulting appointment are a stark departure from the aim of universal suffrage and further erode the ability of Hong Kongers to be legitimately represented. We are deeply concerned about the steady erosion of political and civil rights and Hong Kong's autonomy. End quote. State-run Global Times hit back at the G7 statement. Indeed, a lot of state media in the last few days has been attacking the G7 statement, claiming that the G7 only wishes to, quote, advocate fake democracy with rampant violence, end quote, and that Hong Kong is a true democracy, whereas G7 countries are simply systems of, quote, chaos and violence, end quote. Last up, the housing market, and our old friend is back in the news, China Evergrande. According to filings with the Shanghai Stock Exchange, China Evergrande Group's onshore unit won bondholder approval to extend payments by six months on two yuan notes originally due last Friday. The company did not disclose the balance of the two notes that were extended, but currently uh, it has 13 outstanding bonds uh, bond issues with a total balance of 55.85 billion yuan or 8.38 billion US dollars. Evergrande, the crisis hit developer in the middle of a debt restructuring, faces a jump of debt payments or buybacks this month, and this key extension saves the company by allowing it to avoid an onshore debt default. It is for this reason that many commentators have argued that pressure was probably put on these bondholders to okay the extension. We remember back in January, the 300 billion US dollar debt leveraged mega developer told investors that it will unveil a debt restructuring proposal for creditors by the end of July. However, Evergrande is yet to clarify whether the debt restructuring will include both onshore and offshore debts. So far, Evergrande has not officially defaulted on its onshore debt, though it has defaulted on a dollar bond. Now, there is one more housing market development that I wanted to touch on too while we are here. Local regulatory easing, which we have been following this year closely, continues into May. However, according to a tally by China-based 21st Business Herald, between April 29 and April 4th, at least 12 Chinese cities unveiled new home buying rules 
from lowering down payments to housing subsidies, basically regulatory policies to promote home buying. Yet, as we have seen before in other case examples, despite these measures aimed at increasing or at the very least maintaining sales, home sales among the cities being tracked by the 21st Business Herald plunged by 52.3% between April 23rd through May 5th compared to the same period last year. Another naked example of just how ineffective these local support measures are in the current market environment. Much more firepower will be needed if the state wants to arrest the housing market collapse and pump it back up.